Uh, we are now ready for the panel discussion. And so please, uh, <coughs> open your ears and get ready. So hi everyone, my name is Andrea Tote and I work as a, a postdoctoral research fellow at the Department of Health. I have the honor to introduce the speakers for the today's session. We have four excellent researcher roles. Lotte Meiler, she is a professor at the School of Culture and Society at the Department of Anthropology at Aarhus University and the mother of three boys. <laughs> she received her PhD in 2001 and continued her academic career as associate professor and uh, since 2012 as a full professor. <coughs> professor Minard is best known from her work on human security, post-conflict development, medical anthropology, education, HIV AIDS in East Africa. Lotte Meinert has conducted anthropological fieldwork and worked in various parts of Uganda and for a total of more than seven years. She has also done shorter periods of fieldwork in Indonesia and Kenya. She was nominated two times for the Danish Elite Researcher Prize. Please join me in welcoming Lotte Meinert. She's a professor at the Department of Physiology and Behavioral Science at Aarhus University. Also, she's a leader of the Center on Autobiographical Memory Research, CONAMOR, a center of excellence funded by the Danish National Research Foundation. She received her PhD from Aarhus University in 1997 and continued her academic career first as an associate professor and since 2006 as a full professor. Professor Bastan is best known from her pioneer work on involuntary autobiographical memories, the kind of memories that suddenly comes to mind without your intention. In the year uh, that Dorothy received the Center of Excellence grant almost 10 years ago, she was the only woman and the only researcher from the social societies in group of nine researchers. Please join me in welcoming Dorothy Bernstein. Lisa Bogensen is the Vice Dean of the Department of Health at Aarhus University. She received her PhD from the University of Copenhagen in 1995 for her work in diabetes research. She worked as a postdoctoral researcher at the Script Research Institute in the United States. In 1994, she returned to Denmark as an associate professor and a professor at the Institute of Experimental Research at Aarhus University Hospital. Six years later, she became the vice dean at Health of Aarhus University. Lisa Bogen is best known from her research on extracellular matrix biology and inflammation. Please welcome Lisa Bogen. Can I make an ad? Yes, please. I have three children. <laughs> Unfortunately, this personal life story is not available. That's a no, they're not on tour. They're not registering. And at last, but not at least, we have Trina Bilder. She is a professor at the Department of Bioscience at Aarhus University, where she teaches behavioral biology and zoology. She received her PhD in 1999 at Aarhus University based on her studies on predator prey interactions and life history biology in Anthropology. She subsequently been postdoctoral fellow at the Ben Gurion University, Israel funded by the Danish National Research and Science Research Council. She returned to August in 2002 as a Carlsberg Fellow. Professor Bilder is a researcher in evolutionary ecology, focusing on social evolution, evolution of mating system, sexual selection, sexual conflict, inbreed effect, population genetics, and genotype X phenotype interaction 
using spiders as a study system. She was awarded with Marie Curie and Carswell Fellowship. Please join me in welcoming Trina Gulda. to the four of you uh, for being here. Uh, we would like to open up a discussion about your, <coughs> your life as a scientist and a researcher. And we have prepared uh, some questions to help us with that. And then we also welcome um, questions from the audience. So when we are thinking about academic life stories, we want to learn what you have done in the last years of your academic life. And I would like to, me myself as a memory researcher, I would like to ask you about uh, the three most significant events that happened between your PhD, for example, and now. Uh, so I will give you five minutes to reminisce about uh, your academic life, and we will appreciate that you share with us this important uh, breakthrough moments, uh, life milestones that you have experienced, the, the, the four of you. And then we can open up a, a discussion. So I'll leave you to reminiscence with us. Thank you. Imagine that you are telling your life story to a new friend. In this case, a, a hundred new friends. <laughs> Well, I'd like to first say thank you very much to the organizers for organizing this really important event. Um, I know that many of us are really busy trying to pursue our career, so I think it's, it's great to see that so many have come and that you've taken time to organize this. So, um, tell your academic life story. That's that's a bit of a challenge. Um, and I thought, and, and you asked us to point to three significant moments or events. And I thought, and I thought, and then I decided that a person can be an event. <laughs> because the most important um, event in my uh, academic career has been, been a person. It's been my mentor. Um, Susan Reynolds White, who is a professor at Copenhagen University. She was my PhD advisor, and um, we've become we've become colleagues. But I do think that having somebody um, who was a role model for me, and who had an academic life that I admire, but also a life beside academic that I could identify with was extremely important for me one, even wanting to pursue an academic career. So um, she's become my master Yoda. Uh, she's the kind of person I turn to, even sometimes just within myself, to ask what would Susan have done in this uh, situation. Uh, but I also do sometimes turn to her and ask her to advise me, because there are many difficult situations that you have to go through. You have to yeah, choose between people sometimes, choose between um, different options in your life, making choices between career and family and children and meetings and all those kind of things. Um, so that, that Master Yoda, Susan White, is definitely like one first um, and, and most significant event or um, moment. Um, I didn't realize it when I first met her. It happened sort of post that time. I think another important event was when I when I defended my PhD in, a, in an auditorium like this and I, I realized in the process, perhaps it was a bit late you could say, but I realized that I was an expert. I realized that I actually knew most about this theme and about um, among all the people in the room and that they were actually really listening and that I wasn't just doing this for me. There was a kind of need for that knowledge and there was a, 
um, it felt like it was more important that my, than my little career. It was actually important for something else, and that was that was quite a moment, because I think that that many women um, and myself included, we don't feel particularly good about only promoting ourselves. We kind of like it if it's for something bigger and for for somebody else. Um, so that was that was quite a, a moment for me. Um, I think the third, if I still have a little time, the third um, uh, moment I want to um, to highlight was um, when I got my first uh, collaborative research um, grant for a, a project uh, in Uganda. Uh, I was an assistant professor, and um, it was a bit unusual. I was. I was young, I had to collaborate with uh, African older men who were not always very respectful for younger women. And um, I, ha I managed to somehow create support with my Master Yoda and a, and a group of, of women and people to be able to, to do this. Um, and, and feeling that there was, there was support from so many different sides so that I could do it, because it wasn't easy. Um, that was, I think, the third I want to, to mention. Thank you very much. They all sound very significant. You want to move to the side? <coughs> okay. Oh, I also would like to thank you very much, uh, the organizers, for putting this together. I'm very impressed. I'm impressed with the uh, amount of people you have uh, actually uh, been able to, come, to make contact with, and including uh, some of the university management team. I'm very impressed and proud of being here. Uh, I also would like to say one thing before I, uh, I start my life story, and that is I have uh, noticed that it seems that there's a lot of uh, women here with an, another background than a, Dan a Danish background. And I think that some of the problems we're talking about today with uh, more women in research or too few women in research maybe is especially hard on, uh, additionally hard on women who come from a, a different, uh, who, come, who come from a different country. And, uh, the, and, and, the, and on top of the being a woman has this other obstacle to fight with, being not a team. So um, I'm really glad that you are all here today in the audience. And I had the pleasure to collaborate with a lot of uh, women with another uh, background than, than Danish, uh, which I've been very happy with. But my uh, life story, I don't think I've been quite as obedient on account as I should have. <laughs> but I, let me try. Um, so the first one I want to say is how I actually, so my, my life, is, my academic life has never been very well structured. In fact, I never wanted to become a center leader. I never wanted to become a professor. It sort of accidentally happened because, <laughs> because I was really interested. I had a passion for, for research and for writing, and that was what I wanted to pursue. Okay, so the first memory uh, is the following. I had a long-standing interest for literature. I wanted to become an author myself. And I was very interested in poetic metaphors and how they were created. And at some point, I had to apply for a PhD fellowship. And my mentor said to me, and I remember that situation, he said to me, it's probably a bad idea to pursue this metaphor stuff you are interested in. Because it's not, very, it's not clearly psychological. So choose something that is clearly psychological if you want to become just close to getting one of these, uh, these uh, fellowships. And then I thought, oh, really psychological, what can that be? And then maybe memory. And then I stumbled over a phenomenon that caught my interest. And that is what I have pursued since then, that is these spontaneously arising memories, memories that pop up in your mind uh, without you trying. And I'm still fascinated by that phenomenon uh, and still studying and also had a lot of uh, influence on on, uh, on the on the on the center, uh, the, the 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 DNF center, I uh, and, and the, the grant we, we wrote back then. Um, as I said, my life has not been that well organized. I have taken a lot of some detours, and maybe the biggest detour was to 
it took me eight years to decide that I wanted to study uh, psychology. And during those eight years, I had uh, many different jobs uh, and also studied Nordic literature for one year. And I wrote uh, a novel. And uh, those eight years have had an enormous uh, influence uh, actually on me because I now know that there are a lot of professions that are a lot harder, a lot harder than being a university professor. <coughs> Even if we say we work long hours, uh, I'm very grateful for the privilege I, I have. My detours did not stop uh, completely when I started studying psychology. I also published novels, uh, four novels, while I was a PhD student and an, an assistant professor. Uh, and basically, I thought I should become an associate professor because then I would have time to write novels. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't work out. Um, well, <laughs> one final memory was the day uh, I received an email from the Danish National Research Foundation uh, saying that in response to uh, my application that we had uh, received, that they would like to fund our uh, proposal. That was a, a big, big news. It came as an email, and I still remember considering whether I should, you know, <laughs> click. click or not. And then telling myself, you know, it won't change anything if you click. They have already decided. <laughs> and, then it and then, it, to my great surprise, and you know, disbelief, said, well, we would like to fund you with, with this big amount of money. So I had to run out and ask some of my female. Uh, uh, PhD students and colleagues to come and help me with reading this email. <laughs> Am I reading it right? I <laughs> and I said, yes, that's what it says, that's what it says. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um, I guess that's my life. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Do we have the turn this one on? Uh, yeah. How do we do it? I think it's going to go. Yeah, it's going Okay. <coughs> Mm -hmm. ja, så er der et tal på den, fordi toren virker, den har vi testet. Ja. Toren skulle gerne virke. Okay, okay. No, that one is working, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, my story is completely different. When I'm looking down memory lane, what I see, I see I have made a lot of different choices. And I have taken risks, and I have also been very lucky. I do not know um, if I have been ambitious and I was not knowing on forehand which way I would actually wanted to, uh, to, go, to pursue in my career. When I first had to choose between, uh, between fields for going to university, one choice was uh, medical doctor because I heard something about an insulin receptor in biology. I thought that was very interesting. And on the other hand, I had a very engaged teacher in history, so that was actually my other choice, that was to go into it, history at academia. So I graduated, I was enrolled in medical school in Copenhagen and graduated, and uh, I saw an ad in the medical journal, I could get a position at, uh, for half a year at Steno Diabetes Center, and I said, well, maybe I should try that now. I, had this with the insulin receptor and now something is coming up with the diabetes and I knew it was only for half a year I was working in the clinic but maybe I got a chance to go into research and look for more of this insulin receptor. So actually I stayed there for five years and did my research for my uh, doctor in medical science thesis. So what then, and I got my first child. And just to tell the story, when we, I first started, my supervisor, my mentor said, Lise, now remember, you're going into research, you will be very busy. No, no trips to the cinema or something. You have to really, we expect you to work really hard. Then, uh, I think it was three months later, I realized I was pregnant. And I had to tell him, well, now I'm pregnant. Oh, that's great, Lisa. <laughs> Family means everything. <laughs> so, in that way, I was probably lucky with my supervisor. Well, after the five years, I had to choose. Should I go back to clinic? I was educated in, in, as a medical doctor. I, my working priority, or I was actually educated to go to the clinic. But I said, well, now I am trained in science for so many years. I want to go on to learn something new. And then I got the possibility to go to San Diego for three years, working as a postdoc at the Scripps Research Clinic, 
And my husband, he found a place to stay as well, and my son, he got a kindergarten where he could uh, stay during daytime. And we had a nanny coming from, from Denmark. I learned how to make transgenic mice and work with transgenic mice, make biology, and that was a risky choice, but it has been worth all the work and all the work to go there. After three years, you consider, should I stay, or should this family stay, or should we go on, go back to Denmark? And my husband, he got a position in Copenhagen, but should I go back to Copenhagen to where I was as, as a student in the lab or had done a scholarship? Should I go back to Steno, to my old supervisor and my old group? No, I decided to go somewhere else where I was offered an empty lab, a, 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 an empty lab bench and an office at Aarhus University. So my husband, he changed his job and uh, I got the opportunity to start from the bottom to set up a research group at Aarhus University. That was a risky choice. So that was actually number one. Significant was to go to US to be mobile, learn something new. <coughs> number two was to go back to start on your own research career. And number three, I will come to now. Mm -hmm. And that is that I have been, I was locked to this, locked into this lab for a few years and then somebody one day came out and uh, came, knocked on the door and asked how, Lisa, how is it going? <laughs> and actually it went very fine. My group was uh, getting bigger, but he asked, what, what about your future? And I said, well, I would that like to do, I would like to do management and research at the same time. And actually, so by expressing a clear wish and uh, taking the opportunity, I think that's the way that I ended up as, uh, as vice dean at the, at the head faculty. So um, it's about taking risks and also be lucky and grab the possibilities when they appear. And um, yeah, try to feel your heart while you are while you're dreaming for follow your passion. And I can say that my second child was born two months before I left San Diego, and the third child is born in Aarhus. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes, they all sound uh, very interesting stories with particular momentous events. That's right. Thank you also for me, for the organizers, and to everyone. And it's super interesting also to hear these memories. Um, I, I've heard a lot of words that I agree with. Passion, risk-taking, important people that are mentors. Um, when I submitted my PhD application in 93, I happened to become pregnant at the same time. So this meant that when I started my PhD in August, I gave birth in October. And I remember going to a meeting with my to-be PhD supervisor thinking, oh my God, how on earth am I going to say this? <laughs> and of course, I shouldn't. It's unjustified to be nervous, but I was. And he was, of course, completely fine with it. It turned out he has five children with three different wives, so for him it was <laughs> business as usual. <laughs> But the administration at the Faculty of Science and Technology was not so fine with it because I had a PhD scholarship from there and um, I had to apply for a um, um, sort of uh, extra time and they said, oh, we don't have any procedures for this. Is this, a, this is not common. <laughs> and they said, okay, we'll give you six months um, extra PhD scholarship so I could go for six months maternity leave and then they said, don't do this again. <laughs> and this is a true story. <laughs> and um, by the time um, we entered January 95, um, PhD students had earned the right to be employees, or the same rights as employees, so actually had earned the rights also to have maternity leave. So when my second child was born in October 95, I actually had earned the right for 12 months maternity leave and no more talking down from the administration at Science and Technology. So that was opportunities, I guess. Um, I finished my PhD in 99. 
and the natural career path also in natural sciences is to pursue a postdoctoral position and preferably abroad and preferably more than one. And of course with two small children it, it's a challenge. Um, my husband was He's an engineer and he quit his job. Uh, we applied for grants, extra grants so we could pay for the family. Uh, went to Israel to work at, uh, in, and live in the Negev desert with the children and he became a housewife. Um, so he took care of the children and did all, went to the market once a week to do all the shopping and cook and all these things that housewives do. And um, there's a big community of international couples, a lot of couples with accompanying partners, and of course he was the only man that was an accompanying partner. And I, I emphasize it because again it was something that allowed, um, sort of um, opened opportunities for me to do um, the things I had a passion for doing. But what was noteworthy is that he was a genuine hero. I mean, the appraisal that he received <laughs> for sacrificing <laughs> his career and take care of the children and the house so that we could go and live and I could be a postdoctoral researcher and also be a bad mom that is not <laughs> taking care of my children but instead have their father doing it, God forbid. Um, <laughs> I mean, that, that was astonishing. It made such an impression on me because it kind of followed up. Being an accompanying wife is the norm. But being an accompanying husband was sensational. <laughs> so we did that. That was fantastic. He came home. He was unemployed for a while, but he came back, got a job, and, and all was good. Um, and I wrote all the fellowships and applied for all the fellowships you can you can try in Denmark, Carlsberg, the Science Foundation, uh, um, Marie Curie, other things. And I had almost 10 years of postdoctoral fellowships and was kind of running a bit out of, of places. Your PhD age becomes too high and you've got all the different stipends and they don't like to give them to you twice. So, um, I, and at this point, we were not really in a position to apply for a job abroad. I decided not to apply for a permanent job abroad. So, by September 2008, I had money for another three years, and that, uh, sorry, three months, and that was it. But then there had been a job opening in biology, and I had applied for it. And I remember really thinking that, wow, this is actually a job, like a, a real job, <laughs> not a sort of eternity student as most people think you are when you are being a postdoctoral researcher. And um, if I get this, it's like job security. I'll actually have a chance to pursue my passion for, with a longer time horizon. And someone said to me, well, what would you do if you don't get the job? And I didn't have any plan B. It never occurred to me what I would do if I didn't get this job. So I somehow was always just driven by the passion for what I was doing and, and, and wanting to do this and I didn't really have these uh, secondary plans. So I, I presume if I, didn't, if I hadn't received the job I would, have had to, I would be doing something else today probably. But I got the job so it's also about being lucky, being at the right time, at the right place and there has to be a job opening even if you are the most qualified person in the world there's still has to be some match between where you want to be and where you can be. Um, so, um, yeah, that was, um, that was sort of three things I came to think about. But I think I have been lucky, uh, like Lisa said, also being able to pursue and being willing to, to take some risks, being able to pursue chances when they are there, not necessarily knowing uh, what will happen next, not necessarily having a grand plan. But it's a huge privilege to do what you love to do, and to have a passion, and, and to follow it. And it's worth it, I think. Definitely. Thank you. So we heard about support systems in the family, support systems in the career, and then grants being awarded in a collaborative level and in a national uh, level about what to do, what to pursue, what happens, when I don't get a job, what happens after 10 years of precarity that many of us now experience as well in this, these times. So they're all things that I can at least 
uh, recognize myself in your life stories, even though um, even though uh, it's I'm competing with a much bigger pool of people than you were back then, because there's more and more PhDs and more and more postdocs happening every year. The financing and the funding is totally uh, different and very um, complicated when all the money goes to these temporary positions. But yes, we are very eager to get that one job. And we are here because we're interested in that and we're also interested in preparing ourselves to that point or also to courageously take plan B, which might at the end of the day be, be an option or will have to be an option for many of us. So it's very interesting uh, that you um, are bringing all this knowledge into us. And I'm sure that there's a lot of people already wanting to ask questions. But uh, I would like to be the first one. Could I? Yeah. I have never had a plan B. You've never had a plan B? And even I was only appointed for one year, two years, or one year, three years. Because I loved what I was doing. And I, so I, I don't, I was not thinking about a plan B. Maybe it is because if you, you fail and didn't get the position, you had a, you had a mind with, in some way, find out something new. And do not know. Yeah, and, and that, I don't know if that is part of the, the times now, at least right now in the junior research um, program development. They emphasize this idea that you can go out to the industry. Uh, but universities that's not, do not... That's not a plan B. Oh, well, a plan B other than university. Yeah, but that, that is right. Research can happen outside the university. But for those who want to work mm -hmm. and teach at the same time, research and teaching, I guess the university is plan A. Uh, but you are right, plan B is not continuing to research. Yeah. Which I think that's what you meant by plan B? Or, or opening a hair salon? I think what I meant was that I didn't think, now I'll get apply for a job. If I don't get the job, what will I then do? So having several opportunities open at the same time. Right. That I didn't have that because I didn't really, I was only just focusing on what I loved doing and what I wanted to do. Yeah. So the passion drives you. And you can become very strategic, I presume. I don't know, but it doesn't sound as if it's a strategy that has driven these people that are sitting here. Yeah. No, yeah, plan B can be research still outside the university. But we will have to explore those possibilities as well. Um, because one of the main topics or objectives of today is the action plan. I would like to ask you, after you've heard about the numbers and the different situations, initiatives that we could take, will you have one suggestion of what should be in the next action plan that you think, okay, my junior researchers would really benefit from this, or people that I am in touch with really would benefit from this. If you can think of one strategy, be in funding, be in going abroad, be in anything you can think of, how should we improve gender balance? Thank you very much. Yes, because I think it was really interesting to listen to this early presenter who said, when you do something, that's when things work. So I would suggest one of the um, actions by the management is to make some of these uh, graphs visual on our AU homepage, so that when you open our university homepage, you actually see it, it's it, it's called um, um, a gender monitoring dashboard. So you can actually see what the situation is right now and how we progressed from last year and you know having arts, BSS, uh, and so forth, sort of competing up against each other, but making it visual because it is known, for example, from New Zealand that that works. Just 
getting the visuals in your face every time you open and you're faced with your own universities embarrassing statistics <laughs> or improving statistics. So I think that would be a very doable, um, practical thing to do. Another um, thing, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised still, we had a little discussion about this, but at least in arts, I think all um, evaluation committees of PhDs and so forth are, have to have both genders. I'm really surprised to hear that that's not the case in all uh, faculties. I realized, uh, you know, Trine pointed out, then if you make that the rule, then women will have to only sit and do evaluations. We don't want that, no thank you. We want to do our research. Um, okay, a third thing, if I can say a third thing. I actually think that it would be interesting for AUFF, our own research foundation, to do a kind of Briar fund, something that is a research grant for women. Mm -hmm. Full stop. Thank you. Okay. <coughs> I would like to, <coughs> to continue uh, by saying I agree with, uh, with many of the things that are, that are being said already, uh, but I think one, one from, from observing sort of department policies and how things are going uh, locally. I think one one important factor is uh, the timing of open positions. That was also part of the life stories. And the timing of positions, when to have a call for a, 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 an assistant professorship in, in such and such area, the timing is not accidental, right? It, we know that it's <coughs> at least that's my impression. It's often uh, done with specific applicants in mind. Now it fits into this person's, or the, these people's career, that there will be an open call now. And I think some sort of policy making these things more transparent and more, um, yeah, more more favorable to both genders, maybe, uh, and <coughs> people with also different national backgrounds. <coughs> Would, would be a good thing to, to make these, the, the timing of the calls is really, really a crucial factor in, in ensuring uh, positions. I also think it would be good if we had more women in the management team of all universities, not that I'm unhappy with the men who are there, but, but I just, it's just a fact that if there are a more, uh, if more uh, even balance in management, then maybe there will also be a more uh, even balance in, in who are being hired for positions. So that was suggestion or whatever it's called, or we should call it number two. The, the last thing I would like to say is I'm surprised that Old University does not have a policy for or against sexual and other types of harassment. That, because it does, it does take place. This, that are the stories you don't hear about. Uh, if we had that, uh, maybe something would also change. So. Now I have two hats on. Right? Now you have two hats on, yeah. So, uh, it's, it's, so which hat should I take on right now? <laughs> the researcher hat. Okay, because I have been listening and writing down the notes for the coming action plan. I can help. Is that the... Oh, okay. Uh, so I can take my hat on as researcher. And uh, I think uh, at the Aarhus University, when, when I arrived, you know, it was welcome. You can be in the basement. Uh, we will open the door, and as I told, three to five years, and see how you are going, how it's going for you. So, having a, you know a professional introduction to newcomers, even and that's not only about gender. I know that, but that's very important. And uh, to know uh, the criteria for for, for, advance, for for advancing in the career pathway is very important to be aware of. And the uh, possibilities for local grants and, and so on. Because uh, it's, uh, if you don't get that information on forehand, you may have difficulties, you know, several years from there. When you start. So that would be my... And, and if you allow me to intervene here, uh, it takes a tremendous amount of time to learn English. 
if you manage to learn the English as, as, a, as a foreigner. So a lot of the times we find the material is not translated or it's not available, or you miss out on social, networking, scientific, uh, conferences, uh, science contribution, communication, because a lot of the things happen in, in Danish. But even for me, coming, I was being, I know I came from Copenhagen, but I was, I was being some kind of so, <laughs> so it's very, and, and you have not been studying at Aarhus University, and you only a very few persons. Yeah. So obtaining a network yeah. takes years, and you have to be aware about that when you receive uh, talents from abroad or even from Copenhagen. <laughs> Actually, to be a professional and open, give all this information. When I had to call people about the uh, help, you know, they didn't know me, who is that strange person? She's speaking with, a, she's a woman, she's speaking with a funny dialect, and so I do not know her, and then they hang up. So it takes a lot of time to get this uh, network, I have the uh, research going on. And I think the institutions should, should be much more aware about that than recruiting people. You know? we are, we're taking notes. <laughs> Yes, so it sounds as if you were talking about things one could do to sort of promote um, or, or retain the big challenges that we're losing the, the best female researchers because there's so many structures and biases that somehow prevents uh, women to pursue the career needed. And um, I actually think that this is all. This all comes down to biology, because um, I mean there were long periods of historical time um, where this is not biology. This is first culture. <laughs> There's culture and biology, but there are long periods of historical time where women could not, they couldn't even take an education because they were not allowed to be at universities in many places. Um, and then there has been uh, like a culture that as soon as you got married, you, you um, stopped whatever you were doing. I know many people that started an education and it was a pastime for something you did until you got married and could become a housewife. So, of course, we have a huge cultural um, um, in heritage, which is very, very difficult to deal with because it also creates a lot of expectations, whether they are conscious or unconscious, there's a lot of expectations of um, what is a, a good um, researcher, what is a good mother, what is a good wife, what is a good partner and so forth, and we, if we want to live up to all of them, it's basically impossible. So I think that also creates a lot of uh, conflicts in how to deal with different, um, di different roles where we want to succeed in all of them. But with biology, I also think that um, because basically we have to perform and it's a very um, hard and long competition that we're in, we have to perform well to get the right grades to go into PhD school, we have to perform well to write, uh, generate good research, write the good papers, to be competitive and get the good research grants because in the end we'll be valued by having the good papers, the high impact, uh, results and the grant money, and that's basically how we get a job. And all of these factors are hugely competitive, and our biology, our evolutionary history is in such a way that men um, were, who are stronger and have a much higher level of aggression, uh, and testosterone is a, a driver behind some of these traits, um, these traits were needed. They had to be able to fight, um, they had to be able to catch um, animals for our food, so they've been evolutionarily selected to be competitive, strong, and individual sort of based in order to manage their chores. And for uh, many of the female traits, it was about, first of all, you, we have to carry the babies and we have to care for them because otherwise it won't survive. So we are kind of evolutionary, evolutionarily selected to deal with their family-based situation, take care of the children. Children make everything succeed in a big environment, have many goals in the air. Um, so there are some differences in capabilities that might not be things that are shaped by history, but which is actually our biology. 
So I have a hypothesis, which is that the career pathway is a male-driven pathway for males. So if we want to really change things, we may not only need to be able to compete on publications, impact and grant money, but we may need to um, develop a way of uh, new criteria of skills that we think are necessary and that the university needs. Because it's really important that the university is not only writing down some things that they want in order to uh, uh, recruit all the good female talents, um, but also actually um, make it happen by implementing new ways of um, evaluating, maybe. And this is probably very difficult to do. But I think we need to consider skills that contribute to excellence in science. And it could be, say, skills at um, getting a sense of excellence or putting together the right group of people. I don't know what. Maybe not individual-based skills. Sorry, this was a bit long. And have a short one. You also need to have fun. <laughs> Are we supposed to comment on one another's? No. I, I think you can contribute to the discussion and we'll open it in two seconds. I just want to say that I I think I disagree strongly with what you said. Um, I think the evaluation criteria we have now and the, uh, sort of the more individualistic uh, based evaluation criteria are the right ones for Research and I think women can easily make it there as long as as the assessments and the timing and so forth are done in a fair and open way. Uh, that's my attitude. So, and I also think women can be just as aggressive as men. At least I certainly can. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe in, in different ways. So I I don't think I. Totally buy uh, the the idea, although it is. I mean, I I appreciate you bringing it up because it's very interesting. But I don't I don't agree. With it. <laughs> I I hope nobody thought that I said that women can't compete on these conditions because that's not what I mean. Okay. <laughs> we have noted all of the contributions that you have made and they will go on the report that we will hand them to Uffe, uh, who is not a person, is a committee for external cooperation. Uh, with the but mostly things, men, yes. <laughs> but mostly men, uh, with the, the, um, that has granted the money for this activity and other activities that we had earlier. So, in order to make this happen, um, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand little by little, and then I can take note and give turn to about five people at the same time. So we open the, the question, the floor for questions from the audience. Yes, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, <laughs> first round of questions. One, two, three, four, uh, wait, 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 four, five. Yeah, I just try to remember who it is. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm Marina Romero Ramos. I'm a lecturer in biomedicine here in Amos. And um, I was wondering, uh, at least in my department, one of the we have been talking about role models. And um, let's face it, in my department, the majority of the extremely successful researchers are made. And in the last round of the FSS grant, I think the department received seven, eight grants, maybe. Seven, eight? <laughs> All of them were males, which I cannot believe that we don't have any single female research in the department who didn't deserve a grant. I don't know how many females applied for that. Um, but uh, I think one of the things that uh, I think it will be positive for, for the system is a little bit what, um, what uh, Lord has suggested about the, how having uh, some kind of a female-oriented uh, uh, grant. Um, I'm just thinking that we should have some kind of like reward system where females researchers are put up in the in a visible place where students and other uh, researchers can look up towards 
um, and that can be in the form of a, of a prize or a grant or a, some kind of nomination of a re female researcher of the year of Aarhus University or something like that. I think we need that. And, uh, and okay, maybe, maybe they will say, why don't we have a male researcher of the year? Because we don't have gender imbalance towards men. And uh, when we talk, when we hear from, from the US, for example, uh, when they support minority, like the Native American minority, to come to universities, they are actually doing that. They are trying to, to support the people who are minorities. So in this place, women are minorities. So what do you think about this supporting towards women in, an, in a very active way? Okay, so, so looking for a prize of female researcher of the year. What, what do you think about something like that? Will it be, will it be possible in the Danish cultural background? Because that's another thing. Mm -hmm. um, I have two things I'd like to say. One thing is that from talking to a lot of women, women are women's worst enemy. Yes. Mm -hmm. No women want any prize because they're a woman. They want the price because they're the best researcher. But that, but that's a, a, a wrong, wrong understanding. I understand. How do you achieve that? I, I know that, but I know a lot of women that have a big problem with this, and it's a really difficult problem because there's also a way of talking about these things. People talk about it as if, oh yeah, you got that because you were women. So they always forget that you have to be super qualified to even be in contention for anything, any price of any sort. But it's not the quality which is emphasized. So there is something about the rhetorics about this which is challenging. I'm not sure how to deal with it. But there is a way to deal with these things which is very common now in publishing in biology. And that's called double-blind reviewing. And there's a lot of studies showing that if you, if you don't have the name of, uh, if, if you don't reveal the sex and even the name or group where you come from, from the candidate, and, and actually, it also works um, uh, for the reviewers. Um, you actually see less of the biases. The journals, for example, that have done that for publications found that suddenly they massively increased papers accepted from female researchers. You probably know of this study from Sweden where they gave a CV to be, um, to be valued by the Research Council. And when they swapped a female to a male name on the same CV, the, the CV was judged much better when it was a male name compared to a female name. So maybe one thing to do is to actually think about blind uh, review. May, may, I, may I just do a, a short, very short comment, and please don't kill me because of that. But this comment that you said about women being the, the worst enemy, I found that it's more common, sorry, ladies, among Danish women than other cultural background women. So I've heard here many Danish women saying, I don't need anything given as a gift. And I said, well, I, I, don't, I don't believe it is a gift. Uh, it's something that you earned yourself. Uh, something in the Danish community has made the women believe that they, they shouldn't be uh, helped in any way, in any direction, even if it's obvious that you need help sometimes. <laughs> and uh, even that you're quite happy that male get, males get this help. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Anyway, I, I think I think we should be careful with saying this, that women are the worst against women, because it's also something that men pull up and say, well, you keep each other down. <laughs> well, I also have a lot of really good female friends and colleagues who really help me, who are really supportive. But I wanted to say, because this is the quota discussion, and it's so big in, in, in gender issues, and I... Of course, nobody wants to get something, a grant or a prize or something, only because of their gender. But the fact is that we are unequal, that we, we have a situation that's structurally unequal, and if we don't intervene, then our university management, management will continue to be male forever, perhaps. So we have to intervene somehow, even if we don't like it. And by the way, even if we don't have quota, sometimes if you get a professorship, your male colleagues might say, well, you got it because you're a woman, even though there aren't any quotas. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a difficult discussion, but it's, we're in a structural situation where we actually <coughs> need some kinds of, of intervention. And when it's very clear, 
I think everybody can also appreciate that something is being done. And also men can appreciate it, just like it is the other way around sometimes. In our study in anthropology, we almost only have women because you have to have so high grades, and males <laughs> don't get that in our very biased gender uh, education system, which is you know, something that I think we should also include in this discussion. It's not only about getting more women, women, women. It's about finding out where the inequalities are, and then looking at that and, and acting on it. Thanks. All right, so um, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. So I have so many questions. I have to boil it down to one, and maybe I can yes, also make a comment. So my name is Victoria Antochi. I'm an astronomer, and I'm at the physics, depart physics and astronomy department. And uh, we are one of the red numbers. <laughs> very, very red. So there is a lot of action to do. So first comment on the quotas. I think there are some interesting studies that happened in uh, Sweden, actually, where they look in politics, so it's a bit different, but I think it's applicable. Uh, where they were showing that whenever they were opening uh, a job for a man, they would also hire a woman and vice versa. They actually found out that more, uh, more qualified women applied for those jobs. And also, interestingly enough, more, only the qualified men applied at the same time. Meaning that they, so the mediocre, uh, let's say, applicants, did not, were not as interested. So in the end, they ended up with a pool that was extremely highly uh, and highly uh, educated or, or qualified for those jobs. And also years after they could, they had a high success. So just as a comment. Now to my question. Um, so there are still a lot of colleagues around who think there are no problems connected to hiring uh, or gender equity. How did you approach so far, these colleagues, or do you have any advice to us how we can uh, try to have a civil discussion and try to <laughs> uh, op open their eyes? Because I think scientists should be and are open to facts. So do you have any advice for us? Especially the younger researchers where it's not as easy to open our mouth because it may impact us the next time there is an opening for a job. Who do we want to talk to? Could you, could you specify who? It's more in the general. Um, let's say if I if I now mention uh, the staff members at, at my department, I know that there are a significant number of uh, of male colleagues, mostly because there are only very few women, who are aware of the situation and that something needs to be done. But there are also a lot of and interestingly enough, young researchers who say who are very much against doing anything because implicitly it may, dis it may take away their advantage of get uh, getting a position. Does it make sense what I'm saying? No. <laughs> well, unless they're males. Well, um, yeah, so the point is, I mean, how do you, how do you have a discussion with those that yeah, okay. say that equity, uh, gender equity or equality should not be followed or approached? Well, I find that one thing that really works with, with do we dare to say the word male chauvinists, is to, to talk about their daughters, even if they don't have them. Sometimes that really changes things. Would you like your daughter to have the same opportunity as you? I probably would say you, should, you shouldn't be so afraid of taking the conflict. She's what not. Is, I'm not. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, yeah. I mean, yeah. Well, nobody dies from that. Yeah. I will support that comment that you should take the discussion, take the dialogue. I have done that once myself when I was uh, starting working at the Stigma Center. That was about co authorships. And I did a lot of experiments in the lab. and. Uh, and I was supposed to be acknowledged. And uh, then there were some males dancing around, so just passing through, and they became the co-authors on the paper. And I took that with my supervisor, and I thought that was not, you know, that was not the idea, because um, I had done at least more than the males from so the laboratory had participating, make, creating the idea making the methods, collecting data, discussing the, the paper, and so on. And so 
and that was accepted. But you need to have this open. Take the you know you need to have the gut to take the discussions, and you may come into a conflict, but most of them actually can be talked with, and you can have a dialogue to them and agree upon a solution. But of course, you need to tell that you think there is a problem. I, I also think that um, these discussions often become emotional. And when they become emotional, they are actually more or less impossible to have. And that's a big problem. And it always was a big surprise to me because we are scientists and we should be super rational. But it somehow is, an, is a topic which it, people are not rational about. So I, I like to, to point out the loss of talent. That is the, really a big thing because there's often this perception that, okay, you're a woman, you feel like a victim, you feel the whole world is against you, and, and, and somehow it, uh, somehow the focus is not on the right things. So I also think knowing the numbers, knowing the statistics about, okay, let's look at some numbers, and there are now a lot of excellent studies that point to some of the structural problems, and directly um, identify structural things that we could deal with. So I think if one can force a dialogue away from being emotional to dealing with the actual numbers and to pointing out uh, the loss of, of talent, so we want excellence everywhere, but we, so we also need the most excellent women as well as the most excellent men, I, I think is a way to go. Thank you. Um, yeah. Um, there was a thing that I wondered about the thing when when you told your story, and uh, that was uh, when you talked about your husband uh, going with you and taking care of the family. Uh, that that was great, but but uh, then then you made made this joke about, uh, or maybe it was every everybody laughed that that he was perceived as some sort of a hero mm -hmm. for doing what he, he did. Yeah. And, and I was thinking, well, hero is maybe a strong concept, but he did something that many men do not do. Yes. You were able in your family yes. to arrange things, to enable your career. That's a great thing. And I think that it's, I think it's great to acknowledge that. Yeah. But, but so so, so I would like to, to, to ask this to all of you in, in, in the panel. So so how do do you want to deal, or how have you dealt with, with, with this thing that is laying underneath that that the male society seems to have like a a guilt uh, that has to be paid back, and it's so sort of becoming a bit sort of stereotypical. So it's. Almost, it sometimes gets difficult to to then do the right thing because because it's not enough or it's ridiculous or or I mean, so what are your thoughts? I, I thought the question became a little bit unfocused towards the end. No, yeah, no, no, but but, but it's, it's like so. What what seemed to me to be underneath. Uh, yeah, the, the joke about, about your, your husband being a hero, what are the sources yeah, for that? Okay, but my point was that it was really recognized that what he did was unusual. And yeah. that's and kind of the unusual. core of the problem. Yeah. If everyone, if this became the norm, then it wouldn't have been an unusual task. And Lisa was pointing to her husband doing similar things. So, yeah. so uh, I didn't mean it as a joke or to in any way uh, indicate that he did anything which is not very laudable, you know, but, but the fact that it's so recognized by my surroundings everywhere, it's being noticed. That's, uh, to me, was, was very, very interesting to observe. And I know that there's a lot of debates in Denmark about, for example, paternity leave, and there's all these political um, in sort of thinkings about should we um, uh, force fathers to have more leave because that could have implications for everything, particularly also women's career paths. And one of the arguments you very often hear for not, doing, not choosing to do it in families is that fathers earn more than mothers. 
And then there's this economical argument that we cannot afford it because he, his salary is too high, we can't afford to lose it. And for the statistics showing that for every child you have as a female uh, on, and go on maternity leave, you are 10 years behind in the salary statistics um, by the end of your life. So this is like it's something you can deal with. You can say equal pay for equal job. You can somehow compensate so that you don't lose out in your salary, which means that you could equally well be the one to uh, pursue your career while the father uh, goes on leave because you don't have an economic loss. So this is a structural thing which should be fairly easy to deal with. All the statistics are appalling. Yeah. Concerning maternity leave, um, it maybe I'll get very unpopular now, but it it is a, it, it can be well it is a problem to take a year out of a research career if you're part of collaborative teams. And at the center, I'm uh, leading the, the, the we have had maybe we have a lot of, 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 of female researchers uh, maybe. 60-70% are female researchers and, uh, and so there has been a lot of maternity leaves for, for, good, for good reasons and we, we hire female researchers not like we discriminate of course against uh, for females for that reason but at the same time I think we have to also acknowledge that it really is a problem for a research project if a key person goes out on leave for, for one year because it delays the publications, it delays everything it can be appointments with participants or other collaborators that uh, is, is, uh, are collapsing and so there's a lot of things to, to, to take care of in, in that context and it would really help a lot if it was just like six months mm -hmm. and the father took the other six months or something like that. It would make a huge, huge difference. Uh, it has made a difference. At, at, at <coughs> good difference that all university agreed to take over the, the salary expenses in, associated with the university because otherwise it really uh, it was the, the, the grants, the external funding that for a long time had to pay for it on top of losing the labor, mm. losing the, the, the people. So so that's a, that's a, that was a good step. But but it's still it would I mean it makes it makes a huge difference if you take six months out or you take a year out. So that's something to consider in the family. Thank you. Yeah, well, uh, I say thank you for your uh, lecture and your experiences. But I also agree with Trina when she said that uh, this no uh, runs competition. Because maybe for you as Danish, even when you go out from your comfort zone and you went to different places and different cultures, it's not the same as foreigners and also even it depends on our own background. But we have to compete among our own uh, uh, colleagues and also against you. And I mean, it's not like in this kind of competition to want your jobs. It's not in that way, but it's more complicated. And sometimes to win uh, or to earn a grant, it's even more difficult. So I think it's not because we can't, it's more this kind of rethinking how the grants could be assigned. And for example, there's a, a, a grant in the Netherlands uh, given by Rosanna Foundation, and the requirements are to have a very good CV, and also a good research, and also, but also to be a woman, and they uh, ask for your background, and how do you and uh, want to collaborate in the country. And I think that's a, a, a very good idea because here in Denmark, there's a huge community who want to share the knowledge and to build new knowledge. So I also want to say that sometimes for women, we have to do extra work and it's not paid. Like carry children, but also to carry maybe a brother because we also have this uh, historical background that we have to take care of others. So I think we have to, to think about uh, how the grants could be uh, given to other women and 
and also I want to say that uh, on the other on the contrary that some people say that women are the worst enemy from women. I, I, I have to say that I stay here, it's so, so delightful for me. And it's a, a way to share like, with more women and to build and to learn and to share. Thank you. Andrea? Oh, sorry, was it one, two? You were next. Yeah. So, I would like to hear about your recommendation. What do you think? When is the best time to start a family during your career? When is the best time? Can I say when is the time? I don't know. <laughs> and again, it's not based on my, it's based on my experience as a sense leader. I think that the worst time you can, the worst time, sounds so horrible, but at, at best, the most vulnerable time is right after PhD and sort of when you're in, at the postdoc level, because the PhD stipend will be extended, uh, so if it takes three years or four years, it maybe doesn't matter so much because you will have you will, you will have an extension paid for. But if, if you when, if, when you come to, to the phase where you have to compete for these uh, few assistant professorships and, and that's that's where things are getting really uh, tough. And so that that would I, I that's where I would say this. that's the mo most vulnerable the period that is most vulnerable to leave, be uh, no matter if it's maternity leave or other kinds of leave, could be other kinds of leave as well. And I would say, have them while you're a student. Maybe that's too late. <laughs> um, but and, and I'm sure that other departments wouldn't like us to to, to say that. <laughs> but but I actually think, at least for me, it became increasingly difficult to have children because of my career. But while I was a student, I had the first one, I had a second one during my PhD, and then as an assistant professor, I had the third one. And that was, oh, that, I almost broke down. That That's difficult. So I actually, and then I really also didn't agree about the biology comment you, you made, but here there's a, there is there is some biology involved, I, I do agree go. here, <laughs> but it's, it, it's actually, Maybe easier to get pregnant also when you're a bit younger. So this thing about postponing, postponing, I think mm. maybe we should also be mm. careful That's about recommending that. Kind of <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's difficult to make any recommendation because I didn't plan the first one. You know. Or the second. Or the <laughs> oh, actually the second because uh, when I got the first one, I thought, and, and at that time maternity leave was only four months, so it didn't actually have so much impact on uh, on my stay at the Steno Center. Um, of course, in the season back, I would like to have more uh, longer maternity leave, but that was at that time. I'm so old. So, um, and uh, then I thought, well, I couldn't have any more to children before I had done my thesis work. And starting at US as a postdoc at a new place would not be a good idea then to become pregnant at that time. So at the end of my postdoc, I thought it could be nice to have give, uh, give birth to, uh, to child number two. And also because I thought it could be a good experience to have a baby in another country and try that. <laughs> so, so that uh, I planned so I could uh, have uh, Anna just two months before we left. And uh, then I started my work at Aarhus in May. I was coming back, I was returning to Aarhus in January. And then I thought now I have to start up my, my own research group. And that took some years. And then I got Peter. So, uh, so um, I think probably when you are younger, it's more easy and you, you don't speculate so much about anything when you are younger. So, but in, in another way, we say we, we would like to have people or students in uh, while they are young to doing research because they are more mobile. But then at the same time, we say they also should have the kids. Right? <laughs> then it's a little bit. Uh, but you know, kids love to stay abroad as well. My son, he has got a network 
in Mexico and all over uh, the, the world by having staying three years in, in San Diego. So also the kids get something out of it for a lifetime. And he is actually now a husband following his wife to a stay abroad. <laughs> It, it can be difficult to be able to plan as well as you did. <laughs> Somehow it doesn't always go as you would like to go. Biology. <laughs> Biology, yes. And I have many times thought that if you plan your children, they will never fit. No. Because um, then there's an exam or there's a PhD to pass or there is a postdoctoral fellowship to complete, so it will never be a good time. It's never a good time to have children. But when you do have children, life fits around children. So I actually think that if you want children and you are in a situation where it's possible to have children, you should have your children, and then life will fit around it. I think that's a really important point. I would, it's really difficult to be strategic with these things. And it's really important to have a complete life because if you just, if the career is, is basically um, meant to direct everything you do. I, I, I don't think that's a good idea. I think you have to be complete people with complete lives that are enjoying what you're doing and feel that you are um, have many facets that you function in. So I would say that you should have your children when you are in a life situation where it fits and you want them. We'll do another round of three, three questions. One, two, three, four. <laughs> um, so I was wondering, looking, looking back at your careers, um, they look very great and impressive, but I'm sure there's also been difficult times. And if you recall one of those or couple of those difficult times, what would you, what advice would you give to your younger self in that situation? I think to enjoy what you're doing, which uh, Lisa also said, and the word passion has been said many times. Um, so so um, seeing I think it's really important, it is a difficult career, it is a challenging career, so you have to not see yourself as a victim. I think you really have to see yourself as a player that takes control, and you are enjoying what you're doing, and you're making choices that are positive choices that you have made. You are not a victim to a system that forces you to do things that you are not happy to do. So I think that's super, super important. And I remember when I was a PhD student with small children, I. I went home at three to pick my children up because I wanted to have a life with my children. And I always felt all the others are sitting here studying and I'm going home. They're better PhD students than me. And when I came home, I felt I didn't have enough time with the children and so I wasn't a, a, as good a mom as the others were. And at some point I decided that this kind of thing is, is detrimental to me. So having a bad conscience is the worst thing you can have. So if you can decide not to have a bad conscience, I think that would be super helpful, super helpful. And also, if you have limited time, you become more efficient. The people that were 12 hours at work were not very efficient. They didn't accomplish more, really. They just spent more time there. So bad conscience is something that you should dig away and never allow into your life. I would say um, when things have been tough, and they have been tough uh, several times, it's very important to have somebody to talk to, and somebody who are more experienced than yourself, some good mentors, and it can certainly be men as well as women, as long as they are on your side, and, and so that, that I think has maybe been the most important thing for me to have have someone I could discuss these problems with so that it's not just my problem but somebody who I can discuss it with and who can tell me no it's not your fault it's such and such and can come with a more sort of structural interpretation of things when you're in the midst of all the emotions and 
Yeah, so that, that's, uh, that's what I can see when the peers with which has been really hard has been where I, if, if I haven't had such a person to talk to, then it's really, really bad. So that, that, is, that is very, I think, get, get somebody older than you or more experienced than you you can talk to. Yeah, you mentioned that actually all three of you, a mentor or some kind of role model. And if I had more time, I would ask, how do you find that person? <laughs> Because he, he or she seems very important. There is a mentoring scheme at the university. <clears throat> Empower talent. But can I also say sure. that I think this is also about cultivating relationships and not being only about pursuing sort of me and mine. But, for example, my relationship with my, my mentor is something that I think is mutually beneficial. So it's not only about... Mm -hmm. taking, taking, but it's also about giving and exchanging and um, but I very much agree with, with what Dorton says that having somebody to turn to when things are tough When you, I, I remember when I got my first book rejected at the, the publisher and, and exactly having somebody to talk to who can point out that it's not it's not your personality it's not you it, it's a long process and then you they, you know, you, and you don't die from it, and, and you, you know, you have to, you, you move on, and it actually makes you stronger. And I think it also, some of those, you know, blows that you get, also makes you realize that others who get blows, and we all do, in the, it's a tough world, you know, research, seeing that others are being, you know, challenged, recognizing it, and reaching out to others, I think is what is good about some of those challenges. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Over here. Yes. Uh, hi. Um, I'm from the Physics and Astronomy Department, where we have only two female professors. Um, my question is about actually mentors and committees. Uh, mentors are very important to actually keep uh, female researchers, uh, young researchers, uh, motivated. Uh, I don't have a mentor because I mean, there is actually no one above me who can recommend me anything uh, female, uh, of course. Um, and committees are also important to actually keep females in science because they have to be a gender balance uh, to actually avoid uh, unconscious bias in the selection. So what would be your... Um, uh, suggestions to Aarhus University to actually improve the mentorship uh, scheme that actually doesn't work. I mean, I got, I'm from physics and astronomy and I got a mail, and I'm actually pregnant, I got a mail from chemistry, which cannot help me at all. Um, and what would be also the recommendations to Aarhus University to actually uh, have communities <coughs> with gender balance. I mean, taking into account that since we have only two females, these two females would be all the time in committees. I mean, how, how can we solve these two big problems, which would help a lot? I, I thought you were asking for some uh, recommendations. Yes. And the first thing is about the mentoring. Uh, you say you have two perfect, two uh, <coughs> women at your institute, but I don't think you need to have the mentor just inside the, the, your own institute. It can be one from a mentor from another institute. Yeah, I tried. I signed in into this mentorship uh, thingy, and mm -hmm. when I said, yeah, but I mean, it's a guy, he cannot really help me with, with, uh, <laughs> with maternity leave issues, and then mm -hmm. they told me, uh, yeah, well, I mean, we recommend one year, so better sign off. And when you have the kit and are back, then sign in. <laughs> yeah, but that seems that we have to do something about uh, to to improve that uh, mentorship program that we have for the for the academic career and the university level. Are you postdoc or are you PhD? Assistant professor. Okay. So if I may interrupt here, I also been at the mentorship program, and this also be the same thing. And actually, those who are selecting. They are just HR people or something average, and they choose based on your field. So, but you have an option to put that that you want a female with children. And another thing what worked for me, so you have an idea, go to that woman and say like, 
I got an email for a stranger. It's like, look, I am looking for someone as you as a mentor, and I was wondering if you would enter with a mentorship program with me and mentor me. And she said, yes. <laughs> and she was happy. So take an action, go to a woman who you know, or write specifically that you want a woman mentor who has children. And uh, I think it also helps more than having the uh, yeah, yeah, but rather individual actions, I would like the university to mm -hmm. take action, and this yeah. is what I would like to <coughs> <coughs> Can I just ask you, have you had a PhD advisor or a postdoc advisor? Uh, I had a PhD advisor. Because this mentorship thing, I think it works if it's somebody you have, you really yeah. have been collaborating with, and you really, because it has to be mutual, it has to be... All this that you pick somebody out uh, from some department and go chat with the person, I don't... I don't really believe. It can, of course, it can sometimes work out. I'm not saying it couldn't work out, but I think the most powerful relationships are the ones you have built up through collaboration. So that would be what I would suggest: that go to, yeah, go to close collaborators or advi prior, prior advisors or something like that. Thanks. Uh, we'll try to make it sure if we can. Uh, with the two last questions, please. Yes. Thank you for your sharing. And I really want to ask you about, like, according to your life experience, how could you define, like, being equal? Because I really agree with Tina. Yeah, because we are just more, like, biologically different. And I really think that, like, equality doesn't mean equilibrium because we have talked a lot about the equilibrium in gender today. Like I really think that being only like a 50-50 percent in both gender would not be really enough or it's that equal because before we're meeting some standards the females always like maybe devoted or sacrificed a lot like before meeting those standards and evaluations. And also when talking about the standards um, um, yes, like if you are, uh, if we're going to like make some, like adapt to some new criteria, how could guarantee that the new criteria are not based on some old standards that we already had? Uh, because I think, like as uh, as like people has mentioned, like some we have a lot of like um, unconscious standard, and like this society is just be friendly, more friendly to male. Uh, and those standards are some like male-oriented standards, and we are un unconsciously constructed by the male-oriented society. Like, how can we just avoid this kind of unconsciousness, like in our discussions? To like, uh, as I said, like, how could you actually define like being equal, the equality itself? <laughs> That's uh, what it's all about, isn't it? Is this to change the culture? And uh, I know that with the action plan we have formulated for the at the present time is uh, about intention, what to do, and some plans for how the individual institutes and uh, the faculties can try to uh, improve in, uh, women in science or support women in science. But I think that uh, we need also to um, to to expose the leadership and the, at all levels and ourselves for these biases we are we are having. And uh, until that is done, I don't think we can change the culture because we're still here. Well, if you're doing evaluations or looking at applications, well, I I know I'm very objective. I'm very neutral. I do not have any biases. But if you make some tests, you can. That I mentioned in the morning, you will be exposed that you have a lot of biases in you. And I think that's what we have to work with. But how we are doing that, I think we need input from the outside also so we can learn and take in the experience and knowledge which is outside the university so we can improve. Thank you. I'll, I'll just keep it short. Um, I, I had a Quick question. I, I thought it was a really uh, great idea to have these grants that are specifically for women 
Um, but I was wondering actually because um, I, I know that in some countries, like uh, for instance in, in Australia, New Zealand, Canada, they have specific uh, job openings for for women um, or for um, uh, minorities to apply for these faculty positions. But I've been told that this is illegal in Denmark and this cannot be done. I was wondering how, um, if you have some ideas on um, whether this is a situation that will improve or whether you can work around this, or does this also apply for grant schemes that are specific to women, for instance? Well, I'm not sure about positions. I suppose it's illegal to announce yes. for you know, women or men or mm. and other kinds of... But I do think that for grants, like the old FIRE grant mm. and the old UDUN grant, that was specifically for, I think one was for younger women and something like that. But even but there, Danish Parliament had to pass an act. Right. So these so huge not, grant programs, so it's not something you just do. Yeah. So it, it really has to go through proper political process. Right. So, even so it's if heavy. If we, if we had an AUFF grant for women, it would have to go through some kind of legal process. Well, AUFF being private, maybe there's a bit more wiggle room. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Then I think we'll conclude the panel session with the role uh, models. Thank you very much to all four, and I would like to give an applause to them. with a small gift as a token of our appreciation. Thank you very much.